let me know when it gets any better because it's definitely on. I can move. Okay. Okay. Uh, so it's a great honor for me to be part of this project, and I'm delighted to be back in Trieste, which is both science and literature city for me. I, I just want to have a caveat. I am not representing UNESCO because once you're retired, you're not allowed to represent the organization. But what I'm going to talk about relates to the more than 10 years where I was the lead gender focal point for the natural sciences sector and the consulting that I did this year for the Division for Gender Equality. And during that period, I revised two books that I'll be talking about here today. So my talk is going to cover briefly what has been done in, for gender equality and the empowerment of women within the UN system so that you have some context. For some of you, this will be uh, well-known stuff, but for other people, it might be new, and it's good that everybody have this as a, a basis to start our work in this area. Then I'll talk about gender equality and the empowerment of women at UNESCO leading up to the revision of UNESCO's second gender equality action plan, which I did. And I'll highlight um, work that UNESCO does not only in natural sciences, but in its other domains as they're pertinent to the work we've been doing here. And finally, I'll update you on the SAGA project. I was on the steering committee for the SAGA project. So, within the United Nations, gender equality was affirmed in the UN Charter and a gender equality in the empowerment of women. Uh, but I'm not going to say G-E-E-W because that's just too awkward. But I thought it would uh, make the slide be easier to write. So, I, I have a microphone on me. Is it not working well? The original is here somewhere. Here. Okay. We are having some problems. Is there a way to turn the volume up? <laughs> I could hold it in my hands. Is that better? Okay. And not use this? Okay, I'm going to put the spec. Oh, I can hear it. Okay. So, okay now? Should I start all over? No. Okay. So, we're talking about gender equality and the empowerment of women in the United Nations to give us some context. So, the United Nations was created in 1945. There was a Charter on Human Rights which stressed that there should be no discrimination, including on the basis of gender. And this photograph is from 1948, a special meeting of the United Nations General Assembly where the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was signed. This happens to be in Paris. There was an exhibition last year with photos of the time, and I took a photo of the photo. One of the first things related to women was the creation of the Commission on the Status of Women. And this is a photograph from the subcommission, as it was known at that time, from 1946 in their first meeting in New York. And the Commission on Status of Women plays a key role in documenting what the current situation is in countries around the world so that you can chart progress. The commission led to the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, or CEDAW, which has been described as the first human rights treaty for women. It was voted into force in 1979, uh, highlighting areas of inequality. And it takes um, all necessary measures to ensure human rights are equal for women and for men. It's been ratified by 96% of UN member states, and um, it's up to the member states to ensure that these uh, rights are um, actually given to people. So there has to be reporting to the committee 
on progress uh, uh, every few years, and UNESCO can help member states figure out how to do better so that they can fulfill their com commitments. UNESCO itself reports regularly both to the Commission on Status of Women and to the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. But furthermore, in the UN context, there's another body relevant for us working on gender and science, and that's within the UN Economic and Social Council there's a UN Commission on Science and Technology for Development, and the commission created a gender advisory board in 1996. And from the very beginning, it worked very closely with UNESCO and UNIFEM, which is one of the precursors to today's UN Women. And um, the Gender Advisory Board has a close link with Gender Insight, which is one of the organizations located in this building, because the experts in the world, at least back in 1996, who understood development, gender, and science were fairly few in number. Finally, the UN has four days every year that are relevant for gender equality, and UNESCO always has solid social media campaigns about them. These are the International Day of Women and Girls in Science on 11 February, International Women's Day on 8 March, uh, the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women on 25 November, and the International Day of the Girl Child on 11 October. Now, the first one I mentioned, the International Day of Women and Girls in Science, was established in the, in the, near the end of 2015, and it was... Um, mandated by the General Assembly of the United Nations that it be under the joint responsibility of UNESCO and UN Women. Now, at the um, a United Nations Fourth World Conference on Women, which took place in Beijing in 1995, there were close to 50,000 attendees. And that was where the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action described as the most progressive blueprint ever for advancing women's rights came into force and it established that mainstreaming was supposed to be the uh, main way to go forward to achieve gender equality. All of the parts of the Beijing platform are relevant for UNESCO, but as with the CEDA, whether um, the promises made in Beijing come into reality is up to individual member states. So far, no country has fulfilled all the Beijing platform objectives. Um, every five years, the Beijing platform is looked at uh, to renew commitment and chart progress. And the last meeting in 2015 talked about the persisting challenges between norms and implementation, the uh, persistence of gender stereotypes, and the low level of female participation in many areas of the economy. Here, too, UNESCO has a role to play to help uh, countries uh, improve their performance. The next meeting will be next year, the 25th anniversary, and UNESCO and UN Women are going to launch Framework for Action coalitions with a major event in, at um, UNESCO in Paris next July. All this work within the UN system has led up to what we call the System-Wide Action Plan to Mainstream Gender Equality and the Empowerment of Women. The first iteration of it, when 2012, had 15 elements, and every UN agency or found fund, all the different bodies of the UN, was required to track its progress and report to the Secretary General through the Chief Executives Board. It helps to create a common understanding in the UN of what um, gender equality means for the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. and. Um, gives ways of having accountability by agency for that. In the latest review in 2018, UNESCO came out very well. Uh, it uh, met 87% of the indicators and the UN average was only 64. As you can see here, things have gotten more complicated in the second iteration of the UN swap. There are now 17 different elements. I won't go through them, but they cover in general things about results-based management, oversight, accountability, and human and financial resources dedicated to gender equality and how to improve knowledge, communication, and coherence in this sort of work. Now we switch to UNESCO. And I created the phrase that it, um, 
UNESCO Gender Equality and the Empowerment of Women is everybody's business, so that will be in the new book I'll talk about. But what, what is the mission of UNESCO? Some of you might not know. Today, it's um, phrased like this. Since wars began in the minds of men and women, it's in the minds of men and women that the defenses of peace must be constructed. In the 1945 Constitution, men was considered to cover men and women. It was just a, a given, but we actually went and changed the wording a few years ago. Today, UNESCO's duty remains to reaffirm the humanist mission of education, science, and culture. But that word humanist is important. This is a photograph from the very first General Assembly of UNESCO, and the gentleman who is standing is the first Director General, Dr. Julian Huxley. He, along with Joseph Needham, helped to include the S in UNESCO. It otherwise would have been UNECO. They felt that science was a, a vital way for countries across the world to collaborate and talk to each other about something specific so that they could learn to trust each other. Huxley was one of the most eminent zoologists and evolutionary biologists of the last century, but it was, he was also very important in creating evolutionary humanism as a basis for modern ethics. Coming back to gender equality at UNESCO, women in development, as it was called, was first addressed only in 1977. But since 2007, gender equality has been one of the two global priorities of UNESCO. And there's been a gender equality action plan since that time. Um, each one covered a certain number of years to help with how all the programming of everything at UNESCO would go forward. It was coordinated by the Division for Gender Equality, which used to be in the Bureau of Strategic Planning, but to give it higher visibility, it moved um, under, directly under the Director General in her office in 2011. So the first Gender Equality Action Plan explained what gender equality should mean at UNESCO, and I'm going to read this definition. It's one that I continue to use in all the things that I've been doing for UNESCO. Gender equality is where women and men enjoy the same status and have equal opportunities to realize their full human rights and potential to contribute to political, economic, social, and cultural development of their communities and societies and to benefit from the results. It is the equal valuing by society of both the similarities and the differences between women and men and the different roles they play. So it is not saying that men are, and women are the same thing by any means. Whoops. Um, the Gender Equality Action Plan also provides guidance to the organization how to ensure that a gender perspective is reflected in all the policies and programs so that the institutional processes within the Secretariat, as well as the work we, that UNESCO does with member states, have gender equality mainstreamed. It enabled clear and consistent implementation and monitoring and gave chains of responsibility. If it's everybody's business, it doesn't mean everybody has the same thing they have to do to achieve this objective. And UNESCO, for several years, has been one of only five UN bodies to have overall gender parity in its staffing. So um, why was it considered important to do a revision of the current action plan. It should have continued until 2021, but I was asked to do a revision this year. Well, there are several reasons. First of all, the Transforming Our World, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development came into play. There is a dedicated um, SDG, Sustainable Development Goal, on gender equality. I mapped the work we were doing in all parts of UNESCO against the targets within that um, SDG. Then there was the UN swap second version that I just talked about, and there were further um, refinements to the programming at UNESCO so that more needed to be done to, to uh, capture the resources used for gender equality, and I'll have a slide about that. And then there were evaluations of the work UNESCO does overall, uh, particularly by MOPAN, the Multilateral Organization Performance Assessment Network, and it looked, it gave very positive um, 
grade for how <coughs> UNESCO organizes itself in order to try and work on gender equality, but it said that the results on the ground for women actually are only satisfactory, and we, UNESCO wants to be more than satisfactory. So we hope that this new revision will enable UNESCO to, to do better. One thing that we instituted, and it's now being used as a model in other UN agencies, is what we call the gender equality marker, which is a way of capturing the resources that are dedicated to gender equality. So this is just a screenshot of when you cr create your plan for the work you're going to be doing for, the, for t a two-year period. You have to go into the gender equality action plan, and you have to say how much <coughs> of your resources, of your project, your activity, your program are going to be dedicated to gender equality and there are four levels. It's gender neutral, uh, only up to 10% of your resources will be spent on it. It's gender sensitive, between 10 and 30%, gender responsive, between 30 and 50%, and gender transformative, if at least half the resources of your uh, uh, activity are dedicated to gender equality. So you probably want to know uh, what are the th areas that UNESCO works in. We have five program sectors, education, culture, which is linked with the World Heritage Program, communication and information, social and human sciences, and the natural sciences, which is linked to the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission. In addition, there's the UNESCO Institute for Statistics, which I think everybody here knows about, that gives support to all the things I've just mentioned. There are also key areas for intersectoral work that uh, the gender, uh, Division for Gender Equality oversees. The division also uh, helps to ensure that there's a common understanding of what gender equality means, ensures everybody receives some training, that there be gender focal points in every unit of UNESCO and that they receive even further training, that there is a common knowledge base, that you can receive support from the division, and they work as advocates for gender equality, both within UNESCO and outside, to ensure that there are high-level reports about gender equality in the different domains and things like that. The Human Resources Office tracks the number of staff at every level by sex and reports that to the uh, governing bodies at every meeting. And there are um, many ways by which gender-inclusive language is enforced in everything that we publish. So the current um, director of um, executive uh, director general of UNESCO, Audrey Ozole, asked the director of the Division for Gender Equality, could could she produce a nice book that she could give to visitors that captures everything we do in gender equality because it's all over the place and it hadn't been consolidated anywhere. So one of the things I was asked to do was to produce this book and I called it UNESCO and the Promise of Gender Equality and it's going to be launched next week and so it's under embargo and even I don't know if what I proposed it looked like is what it's actually going to look like but it should be about 70 pages long. For today's talk I'm only going to focus on the things that I think you would be interested in so it leaves out quite a lot. But within the Division for Gender Equality, and I've got the URL listed up there because all the publications that I will mention, you can find there. There'll be links to other pages if you want them. So there's a, one project that the Division for Gender Equality is managing called Divining, Measuring, and Promoting Gender Transformative Skills for Women and Girls in the Digital Age. UNESCO and the International Telecommunication Union are working together on um, this area in the run-up to Beijing Plus 25. And on International Women's Day this year, they launched this book called I'd Blush If I Could, Closing Gender Divides in Digital Skills Through Education, which has a lot of recommendations in it. Uh, one, one part of the book talks about the, um, the concern about voice assistants that have female names and voices and express a personality that is engineered to be uniformly subservient. Giving a female veneer to technology is affecting perceptions of gender in digital environments and um, the coalition called Equals hosted by ITU. 
and UNESCO are creating a multi-stakeholder partnership to try to address this. Hmm. Here's one illustration from the book, and in the book it doesn't look any more legible than it does on the screen, unfortunately. <laughs> But it's showing the gender equality paradox, that those countries with the highest scores for gender equality overall, which in many cases are the Nordic countries or highly developed economies, are uh, absolutely not the ones where the highest number of women are uh, getting advanced degrees in information and communication technology. So where you're getting the most degrees are in um, the Arab states and several other um, parts of the world where you would not expect it. Does that necessarily translate into jobs? I'm not sure. At the UNESCO Institute for Statistics, and I also give you their URL, there are all kinds of things being done to measure gender equality in all of UNESCO's domains. And they have visualization tools, information sheets, and booklets that you can look at. I'm sure you're familiar with the one on women in science, but there are also things like the new e-atlas on gender equality in education, left behind girls' education in Africa, information and communication technology in education, and the status of women's work in the culture sector. So here, this is the 2018 fig figures on the gender gap in science and the number of researchers. <clears throat> now I'm gonna go through the, di the five different sectors of UNESCO. The first line is always going to be from the Gender Equality Action Plan revision, what is the current amount of funding and percent of the budget for that sector that's dedicated to gender equality and the empowerment of women. In the education sector at UNESCO is the lead UN agency for SDG 4, which is the education um, goal. And in order to be able to track that, they have the global education monitoring reports, and those have an annual gender review. <clears throat> There's a new um, strategy uh, for gender equality and women's empowerment in education. There's a picture of the cover of it there. And a new campaign going along with that called Her Education, Our Future. And the strategy tries to improve data improve uh, policy and planning frameworks and lead to better quality learning opportunities. Also in education, there's the Malala's Fund for Girls' Right to Education, established by Pakistan and UNESCO in 2014. And the money from this fund enables UNESCO's education work to go where the needs of women and girls are the greatest, remote and rural areas, the workplaces of the low-skilled, and marginalized and minority women. Amongst the things that the education sector says that it wants to focus on are technical and vocational education, STEM education, and ICTs. Uh, so they do have some projects that are specifically devoted to this. I'm going to talk about the book, Cracking the Code, Girls and Women's Education in STI, or in STEM. I, you might recall that um, Justine Sass came to the first meeting at UNESCO. She's the person who oversees this area. And this figure is uh, both in Cracking the Code and it's reprinted in Saga's fifth working paper because I think it really gives a good uh, framework. They call it the e ecological framework of different actions for uh, changing perception and changing things. So, um, also from the book, um, there are examples of how the sex of the teacher on the left and then the textbook content on the right send messages, whether implicit or not, about what are appropriate subjects for girls and boys to study. Turning to the social and human sciences, um, it supports inclusive social policies that are ethical, based on human rights, and on scientific evidence. And one of the things they did recently was to update the recommendation on science and scientific researchers. The woman on the co cover is Michelle Simmons, who was a UNESCO L'Oreal Fellow. Uh, she's a fantastic person working in quantum computing. And um, with the help of the Saga Project, this recommendation has included gender equality in every single one of its sections to, to give more strength to um, our cause. 
just as with the division for gender equality uh, in the uh, social and human sciences program, there is work on artificial intelligence and implications for gender equality. The Commission on the Ethics of Science and Technology, or COMEST, um, has proposed to come up with a recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence. This will be debated by the UNESCO General Conference next week, and if it's approved, then they will go ahead and make such a recommendation, and it will include gender equality principles within it. Finally, this sector has a new masculinities initiative aiming to figure out ways of engaging men and boys in the fight for gender equality and to promote positive redefinitions of social norms for masculinity. Turning to the culture sector, um, they have uh, worked on all the different cultural conventions, such as the Convention on World Heritage, the Convention on Intangible Heritage, so the gender gender equality is addressed anywhere that it makes sense, such as the collection of information on who is benefiting from these, what kinds of um, economic um, opportunities are uh, developing around World Heritage Sites, and uh, they ensure that capacity building to learn how to do the conventions always includes um, a large number of women. And if you want to get funding to do anything related to the culture convections, um, gender equality is one of the criteria for funding. The illustration is from a book called Reshaping Cultural Policies. And in it, they try to ensure that women and men can enjoy and benefit from heritage and creativity. But they show that women in cultural and creative industries are less likely to earn a high salary, are more likely to work part-time, and face a glass ceiling when they reach senior management positions or uh, decision-making positions. Now, somehow that sounds quite familiar. So one thing that they've done is they created the International Fund for Cultural Diversity last year, setting aside $1 million just to support women entrepre entrepreneurs in digital creative industries. That kind of links with the next uh, major program of UNESCO on communication and information, which does outstanding work to try to address uh, stereotypes, but in areas that you wouldn't even think might make sense for us. So their big areas are working on safety of women journalists, the media coverage of sports, access to ICTs. Their information for all program notes that there is a gender divide within the digital divide, and that it's really important that women have access to both to new technologies and knowing how to use them because a much large, lower percentage of women actually know how to use the tools so that development uh, continues. This year they've published two books, Setting the Gender Agenda for Communication Policy, uh, new proposals from the Global Alliance on Media and Gender, and that has working papers on how to achieve the SDGs, uh, how to include gender equality in media decision-making positions, in regulatory policy, um, talks about gender and freedom of expression, and the rights of women media workers. The second book is Gender, Media, and ICTs, New Approaches for Research, Education, and Training, and it maps all the educational opportunities uh, related to gender equality in media and ICTs. Some of its work in overcoming stereotypes, um, there, you can read it yourself, but only 24% of the people represented in the news are women. Only 4% of newspapers, radio, and TV stories challenge gender stereotypes. And even though the number of women in the media industry has grown, it, ha again, has not re resulted in more women being at the top. And it also made no change on how women are portrayed in media content. So they, uh, the communication inf information sector has some programs to try to address this. One is called Women Make the News, which helps women get internships in media organizations, but it also makes sure that they create stories about women who are newsmakers. And then there was an important uh, book about gender sensitive indicators for media, and that is being used in training programs such as here, uh, in New Delhi for uh, the guidelines for women in media in Southeast Asia. And now we're almost at science for the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission. 
The first ever Global Ocean Science Report came out in 2017, and one groundbreaking thing it did was show what the numbers are of women in marine science. And they were, in the opinion of the IOC, really good. 38% of researchers in this area are women, compared to an overall figure for women in all sciences of about 28%. So they thought they didn't have a problem. The IOC is leading the United Nations Decade uh, of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, which will start in 2021. And it created a science plan and a decade implementation plan for this decade. I was working in 2018 for the United Nations uh, Secretary General Special Envoy on the Oceans. So I had the opportunity to review the implementation plan and my uh, advice was that it was gender blind and that there needed to be a lot of places where uh, things could be inserted that would improve the situation, but I was ignored. Then there was an international consultation meeting to, for, to look at the plan in a large meeting and the conclusions they drew were precisely the same as my own and so they have been working on it since. I've been trying to convince them that 38% is not where you wanna stay. So they have said in the gender equality action plan revision that they aim that the target for capacity building in marine science is now 40% women. I'd like to see it be higher than that. And finally, we turn to the natural sciences sector itself. And um, I'd always organized it when I was overseeing this into about five different areas where we do things. Data collection, which is where the Saga project came in. And uh, another area where we did data collection was in uh, water, water data. The uh, World Water Assessment Program created a toolkit on how to collect sex disaggregated data. Mentoring networks and role models. You know about the Lo UNESCO L'Oreal for Women in Science program and the Organization for Women in Science for the Developing World. The third area is international advocacy for the science <coughs> development gender nexus done by Gender Insight and by Women for Science activities in the Inter-Academy Partnership. And these last three organizations are all located in this building. We also, uh, at UNESCO's natural sciences sector, worked on workshops and summer schools for women in STEM at all educational levels, uh, particularly in Africa. And we did um, a lot of work. UNESCO is known for its valorization of indigenous and local knowledge, but they also tried to identify different um, knowledges held by women and by men separately. So it's just so much that is being done that I didn't want to go into too much detail about it, but I wanted to talk about what we'd done on gender and climate science and climate policy. Um, I'm really proud of this work. Um, UNESCO was not participating in the UNFCCC, the Framework Convention on Climate Change, until 2007. I organized the first ever UNESCO side event at one of these COPs. It was in Bali, and at that time there were two or three new organizations that spontaneously came up about women and climate change. So I ensured that UNESCO joined all these organizations. Then in 2009, there was the third World Climate Conference. The first one had created the IPCC. The second had created the UNFCCC, and we thought something would come out of this one. It was the Global Framework for Climate Services, which is probably invisible to the general public. But we organized um, a panel at, at this event to look um, at gender inclusion and explain my, why women are more vulnerable than men to climate change. And the short story is women are, uh, on average, are poorer. Why are they poor? Because they don't have the same educational opportunities. The poor are the people who are the most vulnerable in any community. Um, then in 2014, there was an international conference organized between 12 UN agencies on the gender dimensions of weather and climate services, and I was part of that as well. I organized five of the working groups, 
And the French government itself, in the run-up to COP21, the Paris Agreement, really wanted to do work on um, to ensure that gender would show up very well in the final outcome document. So they had a series of meetings in the French Senate, the General Assembly, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I was invited to speak there, one of the few times in my life where I've had to speak French in front of the public. Um, but the results of all this work didn't mean that Agenda 21 had a section on gender equality. It didn't. But it did mention the words gender responsive, gender balance, gender equality, empowerment of women. So the next COP, they um, looked at this again, and they uh, agreed to continue previous work that had been done on gender equality in climate change, and they asked that that work continue until the COP that's taking place this year, and they created a website for good practices. And I made sure that the World Water Assessment Program's gender indicators on water are included in that. At the same time, uh, the IPCC is using UNESCO's resources on indigenous and local knowledge uh, within their research, and so there is um, information at the IPCC on women's in indigenous and local knowledge about climate change. And, uh, whoops. I'm, uh, Tanya Blowers is going to have the opportunity to tell you a little bit about OST, so I won't go into any detail on this slide, but I just wanted to say that if you're not all already a member of the OST uh, network, uh, consider joining. You don't have to be in a developing country and you don't have to be a woman to be a member. I'm a member and I think that it's a, a wonderful thing. Uh, if you're interested in joining, you can talk to Tanya. And now we're at the last section of my talk, which is on the Saga Project. If you want to have more information about Saga than what I tell you, you can take one of these cards that uh, gives you the URL if you can't write it down. Um, you'll remember that the STEM and Gender Advancement Project was contributing both to um, the conceptual framework of Task 3, but also our survey on drivers and barriers uh, to careers in science and engineering was shared with AIP for consideration in the development of the survey, but our survey is much more detailed, and so not that much of it was taken up, but it did inform a little bit. Um, we already know that there were a lot of problems before the work we're doing, so I'll skip that. This, these are the advisory committee members and the partners, and you'll see ISC down in the partners to stand for this, the project we're working on here. Saga tried to do uh, four different main areas to develop the methodology and tools that are in the working papers. Capacity building workshops with uh, member states of UNESCO who, uh, who so desired to learn how to review the gender equality components of their national policies, teach them how to collect data and information about their policies, and then we did advocacy work uh, about gender equality in science by participating in conferences all around the world, especially the gender summits. So in the end, we had five working papers you, uh, most of you know already the first working paper, which is the Science, Technology, and Innovation Gender Objectives list with those seven gender objectives uh, with concise number of sub-objectives. You couldn't believe how much time was spent going into refining that. We talked to uh, scores of experts, read hundreds of papers, trying to make it as synthetic as possible so it wouldn't be overwhelming for a member state to you know, have a list of a thousand things. We wanted it to be under a hundred so that it was manageable. And it was, makes perfect sense that in your project that we're looking at a different thing than policies, so if you add to it, I think that, that it's good. It served as a, as a basis. The second working paper is the toolkit and that provide uh, definitions of key terms and classifications, guidelines where you can find indicators, describes tools for policymakers to look at their results so that they can understand them, and provide um, evidence-based policies in their own context. There is uh, a page in uh, 
that working paper addressing scientific unions, but I couldn't carry everything with me and I don't have it memorized, but you can go, go into that to see what the recommendations were at looking at your own membership. The third working paper is a survey of um, uh, STI policies with a model questionnaire and advice on how to complete it. The fourth one is the survey of drivers and barriers to careers in science and engineering, and that's a modular thing. It gives every possible thing that we think you might want to look at, but you pick the parts you want to use at your institution. It also, since we know that the audience isn't necessarily well-versed in statistics, it gives advice on how to assess data and how to present it to others so that it can be meaningfully used. And the fifth working paper is Telling Saga, Improving Measurements and Policies for Gender Equality in Science, Technology, and Innovation. And <clears throat> there we present a short history of gender equality in STEM, the preliminary findings on the relevant importance of each of the STI gender objectives, a summary of the trends and the case studies of the pilot countries that there were in the Saga project, and here's a list of the countries where um, we undertook the project. Uh, the photograph is our workshop in Haiti. In each pilot country, um, an interinstitutional committee worked together, uh, linking all the most relevant ministries in the country. Usually it could be education, higher education, science, R&D, women, uh, every country organizes itself differently, but we tried to capture all of those along with the National Statistics Institution, if there was a National Science Foundation, and if there were such things as a national university. Of course, in a larger, more developed countries where the university systems are not linked to the government, you have to decide which are the most important actors you want to include in the Saga Planning Committee because you couldn't have everybody, every institution involved. It would be unwieldy. One thing we learned is that you really need to have a dedicated person overseeing this committee. Somebody needs to be seconded out of a ministry and put on this job full time. Otherwise, it will always be the second thing they do and you'll be years behind in your implementation. So every country that was a pilot and going forward now, any country that wants to implement Saga on their own should come up with a final um, country assessment or if it's a regional um, workshop um, or a region, countries working together then to do a regional profile that will um, help them to oversee where the gaps are in what they have right now in terms of their science policies and where they need to be making modifications. If they do the drivers and barriers survey, then it would also show them in, in their country where are the key bottlenecks for women's career pathways. Every um, committee is has to make a promise that they're going to embed monitoring and evaluation so that after the final report is produce that you will go back on an annual basis and assess the promises that you made to yourself. You're going to change the uh, national legislation on something. Did you do it, yes or no, and why not? So um, we've talked about earlier this week about how important evaluation is, and so we wanted to make sure that when our funding ran out, it didn't mean that everybody everywhere would stop doing things. So. Um, just one example here is what was happening in the Gambia. Uh, the head of the, the uh, committee for Saga was the Ministry of Higher Education, Research, Science, and Technology. They undertook both the surveys. Um, they were particularly interested in, in Saga because they want to see innovation become something important to develop the economy in their country, but they have very few policies right now about STI at all, let alone to have something to encourage women and, to, and girls to participate in it. They saw Saga as um, an advocacy mechanism within the government to pushed these things forward, and the things that resulted from it, even in the short time since it, um, the project was there, is they created a gender unit within the Ministry of Higher Education, Research, Science, and Technology. The existing such units within higher education institutions in the country were all strengthened. They um, reviewed their existing national policy and considered 
how SAGA recommendations can change that in the future. They included a gender component of, about STI in the new national STI law. And this ministry is now having working relations with what in their country is called the Women's Bureau. So even though STI is at a fairly low level in the country, they're poised to go forward in a better direction than they were otherwise. One of the tools we have um, that makes it easy to compare different countries is a simple thing called a gender objective footprint. You just have the seven objectives around the outside and you count how many policies there are in the country that relate to these. The further out from the center you go, the more policies there are in that area. So here we take five different countries that were saga pilots and you don't really need to know what the details are but the shapes are different. So what I can tell you about these is that for Uruguay, Argentina and Haiti, they had way more policies related to higher education and career development than they did for other things. Whereas in Quebec and the Gambia, they had a lot of policies about addressing stereotypes and the Gambia had a lot of policies about primary and secondary education. There are also other footprints related to other components of the project and the countries found these very useful. Some of the trends that we observed in the pilot countries, if you look at the seven gender objectives, every country agreed that uh, social aspects in the view of women in science um, is really an important barrier, but not all that many countries had specific policies or uh, uh, tools to address that. Primary and secondary education was not a top priority in any of the pilots, even though I said that um, the Gambia found it to be important, they had other things that were more important. The second highest number of policies was re related to university education. By far the highest number of policies related to career progression. That makes sense because there, there often are policies about setting salaries, setting benefits at national institutions or national universities. The least cited objective was gender as a component of the research agenda itself, um, but um, some countries, the ones with more advanced STI policy systems, considered that this was an incipient area that they want to address in the future. And for the sixth one on STI policies, all countries said that they need to do more in their national policies to in ensure that gender equality is embedded. When it comes to innovation, just like with this project, it was five, six, and seven that had the least policies. We found the smallest number of policies for innovation. There is one project that was working with us, which was at the Inter-American Development Bank, where they were actually studying uh, gender and innovation together, looking at how many patents there were and things like that. So there's a chapter in uh, the fifth working paper looking at the outcomes from that project as well. Okay, so in the fifth working paper, we gave examples not only from our pilot countries, but from the reading we had done on what are some best practices or things that uh, countries put forward as what we are doing to address any particular goal. Here we look at the second gender objective which is related to primary and secondary education. And you can see that we revise textbooks, um, the capacity of teachers to understand how, how to treat girls and boys in the classroom and how to better teach STEM because if STEM education itself is more interesting then all children are gonna be more interested in it. That includes things like doing hands-on real experiments in the classroom. And enabling uh, girls to meet role models, people who are higher up in the chain of science than they are. And uh, then, this, this sounds a little strange, but just saying it's a good thing to get a high score on your school leaving exam in itself is seen to be uh, a way of enforcing the strength of science in a country. And then there were some 
new things like this Sci Girl 7 project that was created in the US that was being used in Quebec, which is one of the Quebec province, Canada was one of the uh, Saga pilots. They thought that was a very effective way of reaching girls there. So if you want to see examples for all the other gender objectives, you go to the fifth working paper. And what are some of the numbers uh, from from what Saga has done. This is from our final meeting we had almost exactly one year ago. 150 experts trained from 90 national institutions. Uh, 20 international institutions collaborated with us. More than 300 policymakers were trained, as three quarters of whom were women. And seven countries at that point in time had finished their uh, national report on the status of women in science and the gaps in uh, the policy instruments available in their country. Uh, as of um, this summer, the methodology has been downloaded more than 10,000 times. We hope that, that means that there are countries or institutions actually using these tools that never even told us that they're doing it. <clears throat> So some of the policy impacts that we know that we've had in countries are that in the Gambia, Argentina, Uruguay, and the province of Quebec, they've included gender equality in STI in their national strategies and plans. And other countries such as Haiti and Sudan are in the process of drafting policies, laws, or programs to address this. In Quebec, the position of Counselor for Equality, Diversity and Inclusion was created at the Fonds de Recherche du Québec to implement actions focused on gender equality in STEM. Seven, several policy instruments have already been revised with input from the project to include a gender equality component. And as I mentioned earlier, the recommendations on science and scientific researchers was influenced by the Saga project, as was the interna International Declaration at the 8th um, World Science Forum on Science for Peace back in 2017. The, science, uh, the Saga database has been uh, revised this year. This is just a screenshot of what it looks like. And you can now search for policies and instruments not only by country or by region, but by STI gender objective. And there is information not only uh, for the countries that have finished the Saga report, but for other countries that have done the UNESCO Global Observatory of Science and Technology and Innovation Policy Instruments is included in there as well. So for example, you can do a search and say, I want to look at policy instruments in Africa from all kinds of institutions that address science policy. You type that in and you get this list. I can't honestly remember if my screenshot was just the first part and it goes on for pages or if there was only three examples. What we have is Rwanda, Gambia, and South Africa. I suspect that there is a lot more than that in Africa. <clears throat> So since the project ended at the end of 2017 with uh, funding from Sweden, things have still been going on even without any funding. The Institut Pasteur called me in to talk uh, right after I retired. And they did that because they were looking at their own faculty uh, handbook. They were um, considering changing their rules. And they did decide to change them after this half-day colloquia that they had organized uh, so that women will now be on all committees because they noticed that sometimes they would hold events and there would be no women at all uh, invited as speakers. And they realized that it was because there hadn't been any women on the committee organizing the conference in the first place and nobody thought of it. So now that should be addressed. Uh, the, the invitation actually came from their postdoc and graduate student union, so it's good to see younger generation helping their institution to move forward. <clears throat> then I got another invitation from the Center for Research and Interdisciplinarity in Paris, and as I'm a member of 500 Women Scientists, 
um, they, 500 women scientists said, well, we can videotape it and we can broadcast it live. So that happened. That was uh, February this year. And I just noticed last week that the video is actually on the UNESCO Division for Gender Equality website. You can link it there and you can see Alessandro Bello and me talking about Saga. <clears throat> but you also see some good things that are being done in those two institutions. Then there are supposed to be sub-regional workshops coming up in uh, New Delhi, in Namibia, and in Panama. And I mentioned uh, GOSPIN, the Global Observatory of Science Policy in, in Instruments. It now has SAGA embedded as a component. Any country that comes to UNESCO and says, we would like you to help us review our science policy, uh, and all the components thereof in our country, they have the option to say, oh, and we'd also like to work on, on gender equality, then they will do that. The difference between GOSPIN and SAGA is SAGA asks that the country re countries prepare their own reports. At GOSPIN, it's UNESCO that prepares the reports, and I actually had to review many of them from a gender focus focus in the past, so there's always been some iterations towards more influence, more impact of gender equality in the reports over time anyway. So that's a, another way SAGA has been embedded into UNESCO's work. And just, uh, oops, I guess I don't have it up there. Um, in Kenya, uh, the uh, National Commission for UNESCO started uh, the SAGA project just this past May, and it's being uh, organized by the Ministry of Education with the Ministry of Public Service, Youth, and Gender Affairs. It's including research centers and universities. I'm looking forward to seeing what they will come up with because it was at the very first International Day of Women and Girls in Science where I talked about SAGA that the Kenyan delegation actually came up right after and said, we want to be a pilot country but it took two years for it to happen and by then Saga was almost over, so they're kind of doing it on their own, but that's good because the pilot was supposed to help vet the tools to make sure that they were as useful as possible. We, we learned from the feedback we got, so I hope that that will go forward. <clears throat> and um, at the Commission on Status of Women this year, there was a UNESCO roundtable what drives the gender gap in science, technology, and innovation, and how do we close it? Alessandro Bello talked about Saga. Rosanne Diab, who's here with us from Gender Insight, spoke for her organization. There was an international rising talent from the UNESCO L'Oreal program, and the ambassador um, and representative from Finland to the UN talking at that uh, particular session. I had been at the Commission on Status of Women at its 60th session and presented Saga th it there for the first time at that point. And Chile um, had voted national funds by the Senate to undertake Saga two years ago, and they started the project just before everything started to break down in the country, but I think it probably will go forward even if there's a slight delay in exactly when it's gonna start. Um, here we see uh, Mariana Kraus, the president of CONICIT, the Commission Nacional de Investigación Científica y Tecnológica, and she highlighted that in order to eliminate gender gaps, hopefully in the near future, Relevant data is needed, data we can trust, and that's what the SAGA methodology provides. So her commission, the Ministry of Women and Gender Equality, and the UNESCO Montevideo office are organizing the work in that country. I imagine it'll take about two years. And now we're at my sunset photo. So the end of the talk. I took this picture of this installation called Suspended Together. I saw it at the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto. And what it is, is a representation of the travel restrictions of women in Saudi Arabia, because each dove has a postmark of a letter that's been written by a male guardian to allow someone to travel, a woman to travel outside the country. So, ready for questions. I'm going to suggest